And I'd like to introduce Ron Byrne, who will get us going with introductions today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. We're here for our second lecture uh, on the series from the Special Collections area of the Smathers Library. Uh, and today, we're going to be learning about the Caldecott Awards, which are, I think, most all, I'm guessing, as I see the heads nine, most people know about what the Caldecott Awards are, but they are um, picture books, children's picture books. Um, and there's one award each year for 85 years. And our speaker today um, was a member of the selection committee for this year's Caldecott Award. Quite an honor, 15, 15 people from around the country in Canada. Um, so she knows Caldecott inside out and she's gonna tell us all about it. Now to introduce Ramona, I'm gonna turn you over to um, Boyd uh, Murphy who um, is their coordinator for this program from the library. Boyd, come on over here so people can see you. Thanks, Ron. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Ron said, I'm Boyd Murphy. I'm, I, I work with uh, Dr. Campanegro uh, in Special Collections. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, my colleague, Dr. Ramona Campanegro. Dr. Campanegro is the curator of the Baldwin Library of Historical Children's Literature in the Department of Special and Area Studies Collections at the University of Florida's George A. Smathers Libraries. She's also a graduate faculty member in the Department of English at UF. Before coming to UF as a professor, she was a professor of children's literature at Eastern Michigan University. She received her PhD in English at UF in 2010. As you can tell by the topic of her talk today, Dr. Campanegro has a keen interest in book awards. She's a member of the 2023 Caldecott Award Committee, current chair of the Phoenix Picture Book Award Committee, um, past chair and member of the Pura Belpri Award Committee, co-chair of the Pura Belpri Award 25th Anniversary Task Force, and director of educational programming and content for the 35th anniversary of the Ezra Jack Keats Award. Uh, Dr. Campanegro publishes on a variety of children's book and media awards. The title of her talk today is 85 Years of the Caldecott Award. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm delighted to be here and talking about the Caldecott Award today because book awards really are one of my absolute favorite things. I was facing the other way, so I didn't get to see how many people nodded in recognition when Ron mentioned the award, but it, most of you are familiar with the Caldecott, yes? Okay. And how many of you have a favorite Caldecott book? Anyone have one they can shout out? No? Okay, well, hopefully you'll recognize some of the titles as we're going through today. So the focus for today is going to be looking more closely at the Caldecott Awards roots and its evolution over the 85 years since the prize was first bestowed, bearing in mind that the books that received the Caldecott Medal and Caldecott Honors represent a microcosm of children's literature and the ways in which the field has changed and continues to change. So we generally think of the Caldecott Award as the most recognizable US award for picture books, which is true. But let's look at some of the exact language set forth by the Association for Library Service to Children, more commonly called ALSC, the division of the American Library Association that administers the Caldecott Award. As Al states on the Caldecott webpage, the medal shall be awarded annually to the artist of the most distinguished American picture book for children, published by an American publisher in the United States in English during the preceding year. 
There are no limitations as to the character of the picture book, except that the illustrations be original work. Honor books may be named. These shall be books that are also truly distinguished. The award is restricted to artists who are citizens or residents of the United States, so not an international award. Books published in a US territory or US Commonwealth are eligible. We'll talk in more detail later about what makes a picture book distinguished, let alone the most distinguished, and Caldecott committees spend hours and hours on this topic. But for the moment, it's enough to recognize the award's parameters and especially its focus on art or illustrations. The Caldecott is the second oldest children's book award in the United States after the American Library Association's John Newberry Medal which is the oldest children's book award in the world. First awarded in 1922, the Newberry celebrated its 100th anniversary last year with appropriate fanfare. The Newberry was created to honor the author of the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children, which means that in the award's early years, illustrators, despite their significant contributions, particularly to picture books and illustrated books, were being overlooked by award committees. Similarly, picture books and other books that weren't as text heavy weren't often considered as strong contenders for the Newberry. Of course, there were exceptions, there always are, such as Wanda Gogg's Millions of Cats, which is often considered the first American picture book and is the oldest American picture book still in print. Millions of Cats received a Newberry runner-up or honor in 1929, but many scholars and librarians have speculated that Gog received a Newberry honor really because there wasn't an award yet that celebrated illustrations. It's a catchy text, but really what you remember from this book tend to be the pictures. This changed in 1936 when the idea for an award for children's book illustration began to be discussed by librarians and Frederick Melcher, a publisher and bookseller who had pioneered the Newberry Medal. The terms for the illustration award were worked out during the following year, and the Caldecott was first awarded in 1938. Initially, after the creation of the Caldecott Medal, the Newberry Committee became the Newberry Caldecott Committee, and a book couldn't be considered for both awards showing excellence in writing and illustration until 1977. It also wasn't until 1980 that there were separate Newberry and Caldecott committees, with each committee and its members focused solely on the criteria for each award. The creation of two separate committees reflected the growing number of eligible children's books being published, which certainly affected committee workload I can attest to that. I can't imagine trying to read everything for Caldecott and Newberry in the same year. That would be thousands of books. As well as the recognition that each award's criteria needed the full consideration of that award committee's members. In the past 10 years, Newberry and Caldecott committees have separately chosen to honor four picture books with medals or honors in both writing and illustration. Last Stop on Market Street, Crown, An Ode to the Fresh Cut, The Undefeated, and Watercress, suggesting that the writing and narrative picture books, as well as the illustrations, are now being given more careful consideration. The creators of the Caldecott Medal, however, were focused primarily on celebrating a book's illustrations, and in advocating for the name of the award, Milcher argued, the advantage of the word Caldecott is not only that it has pleasant connotations for everyone, but his work was very definitely the kind of thing where the interest was in the pictures, yet there was never a book where the text was inconsequential. Thus, an American award for picture books was named after the British illustrator Randolph Caldecott. Born in Chester, England in 1846, Caldecott became a bank clerk when he was 15 years old and sold his first drawing to a newspaper, Illustrated London News, during that same year. In his biography, Randolph Caldecott, The Man Who Could Not Stop Drawing, Leonard S. Marcus notes, art 
Caldecott had decided was going to be his ticket out of the bank. Caldecott had no illusions that the sketches he was then making, humorous but slight pictures of people, and realistic but unremarkable drawings of farm animals and landscapes would earn him a living, let alone end up on the walls of a museum. But he knew that a person who drew well could hope to sell his sketches to the illustrated newspapers, more and more of which were setting up shop all around England just then. Caldecott began publishing for newspapers more regularly, and in 1872, 11 years after selling his first drawing, he moved to London to pursue a full-time career as an illustrator. After creating drawings and sketches for newspapers, magazines, and a travel book, his big break came in 1875 when he created over 100 illustrations for Old Christmas from the sketchbook of Washington Irving. And I do love the fact that our American award for picture books is named after someone's British who had his big break illustrating a famous American book. Following his success with a second collection of Irving's short stories, the well-known printer Edmund Evans approached Caldecott about illustrating a series of picture books for children, following Walter Crane's successful series, Six Penny Toy Books. After some negotiation, Caldecott agreed, publishing his first two picture books, The House That Jack Built and The Diverting History of John Gilpin, in 1878. For the next six years, he published two picture books a year with Evans, who, with a clever eye to marketing, also created and published new compilations of Caldecott's previous picture books. In 1886, when he was only 40 years old, Caldecott passed away while visiting St. Augustine, Florida, and is buried there. If you'd like to visit his gravesite, the Randolph Caldecott Society of North America has a map to its location on their website. And yes, I have made the pilgrimage to this site. While his life was far too short, he left a rich legacy within illustration, and especially children's books. As befitting the fast-changing times in which he lived during the Industrial Revolution, his illustrations conveyed a profound sense of motion and energy. You can see movement in many of his illustrations, both the larger full-color pictures, such as this image from the beginning of the house that Jack built, where Jack surprises the rat, and in the simple line drawings interspersed throughout the full-color pages. In the pages following Jack's encounter with the rat, we're introduced to the malt. This is the malt that lay in the house that Jack built, and the rat. This is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. In the next double page spread, the rat's whiskers, upturned in alarm, suggest the cat is ready to pounce on the accompanying page. And I'm pretty sure we all know what happens next. One of Caldecott's most famous illustrations is this interior spread from the diverting history of John Gilpin, where you can see not only the forward momentum of the horse, and consequently John Gilpin, who has already lost his wig on a previous spread, but also the excitement of the chasing dogs, the terror of the disturbed geese, and the shock and consternation of the human onlookers. This illustration was immortalized on the front of the Caldecott medal itself, albeit with a few tweaks, like the removal of the falling toddler in the foreground of the illustration, and the addition instead of several cheering children. Caldecott also played with white space, the placement of text and illustrations on the page, and the page turn to create more motion and a sense of playfulness and suspense for young readers. In The Queen of Hearts, he sets up the action with the knave of hearts stealing the tarts and being seen by the cat, who then points to show which way the knave went in the next illustration. However, when readers turn the page, before they see the back of the knave fleeing the scene of the crime with the tarts up his sleeve, they see him cradling his sleeve full of pastries and seemingly contemplating his crime under the gaze of a woman at the palace window. 
Caldecott regularly included pathos and humor in his illustrations, often through characters' reactions to events or through adding a storyline in his artwork that wasn't actually included in the written text. In Hey Diddle Diddle, the nursery rhyme concludes with the line, and the dish ran away with the spoon, accompanied by an illustration of the dish and the spoon looking very cozy and happy together. Caldecott extended the story beyond the final written line, however, ending with a line drawing of the dish, broken into pieces, and the spoon being hustled away by her parents, a fork and knife, with her knife father clearly scowling. In reflecting on his illustrations, Caldecott said, please say that my line is to make to smile the lunatic who has shown no sign of mirth for many months. Besides delighting readers, Caldecott also inspired other artists, including Beatrix Potter of Peter Rabbit fame and Caldecott recipient Maurice Sindak. In describing Caldecott's work, Sindak observed, Caldecott devised an ingenious juxtaposition of picture and word, a counterpoint that never happened before. Words are left out, but the picture says it. Pictures are left out, but the word says it. In short, it is the invention of the picture book, or at least as we think of it now. Together with his contemporaries Walter Crane and Kate Greenaway, Randolph Caldecott expanded the scope of children's literature and forever altered expectations of children's books, particularly picture books. And our expectations for picture books and even Caldecott award-winning picture books have continued to evolve over time as a result of changes in printing technologies, favored art techniques and mediums, understandings of children and childhood, and changes in publishing, education, librarianship, and society in general. In 2013, as part of the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Caldecott Award, Kathleen T. Horning created a series of six articles for the Hornbook magazine, with each article focused on one Caldecott Award winner from each decade from the 1930s through the 1980s. And some of these titles and covers may look familiar. May Lee, the 1939 winner, Prayer for a Child, the 1945 winner, Madeline's Rescue, the 1954 winner, Drummer Hoff, the 1968 winner, Arrow to the Sun, the 1975 winner, and Hey Al, the 1987 winner. Horning used these six books to explore some questions that have been endlessly discussed since the Caldecott Awards inception. First, what is a picture book? In the Caldecott's Terms and Criteria, the American Library Association asserts, a picture book for children, as distinguished from other books with illustrations, is one that essentially provides the child with a visual experience. A picture book has a collective unity of storyline, theme, or concept developed through the series of pictures of which the book is comprised. This definition provides a good deal of latitude for selection committees about what a picture book might be and which books, therefore, are eligible. And the idea of a visual experience with a collective unity has shifted over time. The first Caldecott Medal recipient in 1938 was Animals of the Bible, illustrated by Dorothy Lathrop, with text selected by Helen Dean Fish. Unlike Syndac's assessment of Caldecott books, where the illustrations and text both contribute to the storytelling through their interaction, Lathrop's illustrations beautifully complement the selected Bible stories, but don't necessarily extend the storyline in any way. The image accompanying the story, The Ravens Fed Elijah, provides a visual depiction of the birds bringing food to Elijah, as the text explains but the image doesn't add a new layer or element to the story. Today, we're more likely to think of this book as an illustrated book rather than a picture book because of the restricted interaction between the words and pictures, but Animals of the Bible certainly still fits the Caldecott's parameters. 
Yet at the same time that picture books often rely on the interplay between words and pictures, there have been Caldecott recipients that relied predominantly or even exclusively on illustrations alone to tell the story. David Wiesner's Tuesday, the 1992 Caldecott winner, uses only a handful of words, mostly times. The rest of this surreal story about an invasion of frogs on floating lily pads that appear on a random Tuesday is told completely through illustration and design. Here, at 11.21 p.m., the frogs, cruising on their lily pads, have entered a woman's home, and one commandeers the remote control. Without written text, readers use visual clues to tell the story of this strange night. And you can get some amazing interpretations from kids of what is happening in this book. Another Caldecott winner that radically reimagines the definition of a picture book is Brian Selznick's The Invention of Hugo Cabret, the 2008 Caldecott winner. This doorstop of a book with over 530 pages greatly expands the length of a typical picture book or Caldecott recipient while spinning the story of an orphan clock keeper in a 1931 Parisian railroad station who's repairing an automaton and trying to solve a mystery involving silent films. And this was the book that Martin Scorsese based his film Hugo on, if some of you have seen that. It also departs from the usual interaction of words and images within a picture book. In The Invention of Hugo Cabret, Selznick uses pages of sequential images, much like a silent film, to tell part of the story. Here, with four double-page spreads, readers follow Hugo down the corridor and through the grate that leads to his apartment in the train station. Selznick also uses pages of text to tell parts of the story. So the pictures and words still interact to make the whole story, but they do so in alternating sections rather than on individual pages or double page spreads like so many picture books do. Following the invention of Hugo Cabret's form stretching success, the 2015 Caldecott Committee awarded a Caldecott honor to this one summer, a graphic novel illustrated by Jillian Tamaki and written by Mariko Tamaki. This story of a pivotal summer in Rose's adolescence, spent at a cabin on the beach like every other summer Rose can remember, and filled with many of the same activities, like being in the water with her best summertime friend and her dad, but now with new complications and interpersonal dynamics, oh, the joy of adolescence, is the first graphic novel to receive Caldecott recognition so far. So right now, one graphic novel, but it's going to be interesting to see where that may go. Nevertheless, this one summer and the invention of Hugo Cabret have created new precedents about what works may be considered picture books, something we'll also see with one of this year's honor books, Ain't Burned All the Bright. A second question that arises about Caldecott winners and honor books is how much does a book reflect the time of its creation and receiving of the award? Books that receive Caldecott recognition are virtually guaranteed a much longer print run. Caldecott books usually don't go out of print for decades. But many older Caldecott books, like many old other books, can appear dated in contents and execution to readers in subsequent decades. However, these books can also tell later readers about the time in which they were published and give ideas about how events during that period may have impacted the book's creation and publication as well as their selection as Caldecott recipients. In her essay, Prayer for a Child and the Test of Time, Horning looks at the 1945 Caldecott winner, Prayer for a Child, illustrated by Elizabeth Orton Jones and written by Rachel Field in the context of the end of World War II. The book is simultaneously a prayer for one child, the author's two-year-old daughter, and for every child. The poetic prayer asks for things that nearly everyone wants for children, for them to be safe, cared for, 
and surrounded by people and things they love. As nearly universal and timeless as these desires are, they were likely to have particularly resonated with people at the end of a long world war. And the dream of a global community can be seen in this image of so many smiling children's faces, even if the style and substance of the image may now appear to be products of their time. The 2004 Caldecott winner, Mordecai Gerstein's The Man Who Walked Between the Towers, is another book that's difficult to separate from the time period in which it was published and received the Caldecott. In this picture book, Gerstein tells the story of French aerialist Philippe Petit's tightrope walk between the two towers of the World Trade Center in 1974, while positioning this adventure as a poignant memory. On the book's penultimate spread, the text, in a sea of white, reads, now the towers are gone. And the corresponding illustration shows a huge empty space in the sky. However, the towers are back, at least in a haze of memory, on the final single page spread. In the accompanying text, Gerstein closes his picture book with, but in memory, as if imprinted on the sky, the towers are still there. And part of that memory is the joyful morning, August 7th, 1974, when Philippe Petit walked between them in the air. This book is likely to be informative and meaningful to anyone who reads it, but it also likely carried additional significance to children and adults who read it when it was first published two years after 9-11. Similarly, the reading of it today is likely different for those of us who have firsthand recollections of the World Trade Center, the events of 9-11, or even Petit's Walk, than for young readers who will only encounter these buildings and events as part of history and the picture books they read. Beyond specific events, many Caldecott winning books offer insights into the time period in which they were created and celebrated even if they remain popular decades later. Maurice Sindex, Where the Wild Things Are, the 1964 Caldecott winner, is probably one of the best known American picture books, let alone Caldecott winners, and it continues to be passed down to new generations of readers. The story of Max's voyage to where the wild things are and then back again to his room to his still hot supper waiting for him is often touted as timeless. But it can also be viewed through the literary lens of the 1960s when it was published and received this award, as that was a period in which books for children began acknowledging the complicated interior lives and sometimes difficult emotions of children. Another common question is about the possible audiences for Caldecott award-winning books. Since the creation of the Caldecott, its terms and criteria have stated a picture book for children is one for which children are intended potential audience. The book displays respect for children's understandings, abilities, and appreciations. Children are defined as persons as ages up to and including 14, and picture books for this entire age range are to be considered. Clearly, 0 to 14 is an enormous age range. Any of you who have taught, been librarians, had children, spent time with children, realize this. Many developmental stages and reading levels are encompassed in those 14 years. And certainly many Caldecott books have been written to appeal to younger children through their subject matter, word choice, and illustrations, including Claire Turquay Newberry's Marshmallow, a 1943 Caldecott honor book, and Laura Vaccaro Seeger's First the Egg, a 2008 Caldecott honor book. Though with a very high word count by today's expectations for a picture book, Marshmallow details how a thoroughly spoiled house cat feels about a new baby rabbit joining the family. And First the Egg explores the age-old question of chicken or egg, while presenting ideas about transformation, cycles, and growth through nature, as well as having interactive die cuts that small hands can explore and feel. While these books are created and marketed for younger readers, 
Their creators and publishers certainly hope that older children, teens, and adults will find aspects of the books engaging and enjoyable too, especially upon multiple rereadings and possibly even more rereadings with the younger kids in their lives. And of course, it's good to remember that recommended age ranges are just that, recommendations. They're not perfect fits for all readers. Even with this caveat, however, some Caldecott recipients, such as the 2023 honor book Ain't Burned All the Bright, illustrated by Jason Griffin and written by Jason Reynolds, are far more likely to engage children closer to that 14 years of age. This difficult to classify book is over 300 pages and consists of only three long sentences with accompanying illustrations that suggest they were created by the narrator, who is describing how he and his family are coping in the midst of COVID-19 and the injustices of summer 2020. He's searching for oxygen masks, both literal and metaphorical, that will help them get through the summer. And he reflects, and I wonder if maybe an oxygen mask is hiding among the crumbs of memories caught between the cushions of this couch where he sits with his siblings, unable to go out. The serious and complex issues raised in Ain't Burned All the Bright and some other Caldecott books beg the question, how much should the messages in a book matter when a book is being considered for the Caldecott? And the short answer is not much. The awards criteria states, note, the committee should keep in mind that the award is for distinguished illustrations in a picture book and for excellence of pictorial presentation for children. The award is not for didactic intent or for popularity. That being said, sometimes books with distinguished illustrations and excellent pictorial presentations also have strong messages. The 2021 Caldecott winner, We Are Water Protectors, illustrated by Michaela Goad and written by Carol Lindstrom, thrums with a timely call to protect natural resources, especially water, while showcasing indigenous people's deep long-standing connections with the earth. And Jerry Pinckney returns to an ancient message about kindness in his 2010 Caldecott winner, The Lion and the Mouse, which presents a nearly wordless rendition of Aesop's classic fable about the lion who saves a mouse, who then later saves the lion. Though the award is specifically not for didactic intent, the awards criteria also instructs committees to consider the following points, among several others, in identifying a distinguished book. Excellence of pictorial interpretation of story, theme, or concept, and appropriateness of style of illustration to the story, theme, or concept which will most likely mean that a book's text, themes, and concepts are being discussed by Caldecott committees, at least insofar as they relate to the illustrations. While concerns about the roles that messages and morals play in books for the young, and which messages and morals are being perceived, have been around since well before the inception of children's literature as a field, the consideration of whether Caldecott books are inclusive and culturally authentic has really only emerged since the 1960s. While the 1939 Caldecott winner, Thomas Hanforce May Lee, introduces a main character who lives in China and the ways in which she and her family celebrate the new year, the 1963 Caldecott winner, Ezra Jack Keats's The Snowy Day, is a much better known book today. With its collage illustrations and story of Peter's everyday wondrous adventures in the snow, this picture book is often considered a milestone within multicultural children's literature. It was the first picture book featuring a child character of color to be published in full color illustrations, showing an investment on the part of the publisher. And it created a legacy of discussion and debate as well as the opportunity for the publication of more books featuring more characters of color. Gail E. Haley's A Story, A Story, the 1971 Caldecott winner, retells an African folktale about the trickster Anansi bringing stories to Earth, 
and Ed Young's Lon Po Po, A Red Riding Hood Story from China, the 1990 Caldecott winner, joins and expands the circle of fairy and folk tales that have received Caldecott recognition over the years. Similarly, Juji Morales's picture book biography of Mexican artist Frida Kahlo, Viva Frida, a 2015 Caldecott honor book, brings the life story of another fascinating person into the collection of Caldecott winning biographies. And fairy and folk tales and biographies definitely make up a good chunk of Caldecott recipients over the years. As Rob Bittner and I wrote in our Hornbook article about the last 10 years of Caldecott Award recipients, more black, indigenous, and people of color have received Caldecott recognition since 2014 than ever before. Five of the Caldecott winners in the last 10 years were people of color, and 22 of the 40 Caldecott honor books were created by artists of color. The award and the experiences of the readers are enriched by celebrating a greater variety of stories illustrated by a greater variety of artists. And last but not least, my favorite question asked about the Caldecott, what was the committee thinking? Of course, this question is generally aired by someone who does not agree with a committee's selections. And I've been very fortunate not to have been asked this question thus far as a member of the 2023 Caldecott Committee. The 15 members of our committee, who called ourselves the Calda Crew, spent all of 2022 reading picture books, graphic novels, early readers, and illustrated books before meeting in January 2023 to deliberate for about 30 hours and make our final choices. Our deliberations are confidential, so I can't share everything about my committee service, but I'll say that it was definitely the most rewarding experience of my career so far. It was also, practically speaking, an incredible amount of work as each one of us was reading hundreds and hundreds of books, taking notes, and considering how the books fit and didn't fit the Caldecott's terms and criteria. Throughout the process, we returned again and again to the criteria, particularly the five considerations for a distinguished American picture book for children defined as illustration. Excellence of execution in the artistic technique employed, excellence of pictorial interpretation of story, theme, or concept, appropriateness of style of illustration to the story, theme, or concept, delineation of plot, theme, character, setting, mood, or information through the pictures, and excellence of presentation and recognition of a child audience. That clears everything up, right? As you can readily imagine, each of these considerations can be interpreted in countless ways, all of which merit reflection and conversation, and then more reflection and conversation. And it was an honor for our committee to decide how we were going to interpret the criteria to determine a distinguished American picture book for children. Our choice for the 2023 Caldecott Medal was Doug Salati's Hot Dog, the story of a small dog who is overwhelmed by the heat and crowds and general unpleasantness of a hot summer day in the city, so he and his human escape to the beach. After this respite, they return to a cooler city in the evening, and they're again able to appreciate their city life and home. As you can see from the cover, Salati's illustrations make beautiful use of color and line and enable you to feel the cool breeze and hopefully become just as relaxed and that moment of bliss that the main character is clearly experiencing. We also selected four honor books, Ain't Burned All the Bright, which I already described, Christopher Denise's Night Owl, a fantasy picture book about an owl who yearns to be a knight and encounter dragons, Michaela Goad's Berry Song, an intergenerational family story about caring for the earth as it cares for us, and Choosing Brave, how Mamie Till Mobley and Emmett Till sparked the civil rights movement, a biography of Mamie Till Mobley and her lifelong ability to make brave but hard choices. I'm thrilled to have these five books join the amazing collection of books that have been recognized by Caldecott committees over the last 85 years. And while I love looking back at the legacy of this award 
and seeing how picture books and our understandings of them have changed. I'm even more excited to see how the books and our ways of understanding them, teaching them, and sharing them will continue to evolve in the coming years. Thank you very much.